what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the Proxon FET table saw. And the FET table saw is something that we've been using for about, uh, for about 10 years. It's made by Proxon. Now, Pam, uh, my wife and I have been doing miniatures since uh, probably about, I think we did our first show in 1982. And uh, we had a Dremel table saw, which everybody had with the big hairy four inch blade. And then sometime in the early nineties, uh, Al Chadronet, who's uh, the late Al Chadronet, who made um, a variety of baskets and boxes and various other things, uh, told me about this Preax saw. And I went down, he lived about 10 miles from us, went down and looked at it and loved it, found it in the Scale Cabinet Maker magazine and ordered one this little tiny saw and absolutely loved it. And I loved it so much that I, uh, I talked to the guy who made it and got permission to, uh, to resell it. So I bought a number of them and started selling it at shows. And yeah. that was somewhere in the mid nineties. And we sold that until Charlie got sick and passed away in the, uh, uh, in the early two thousands. And we uh, got in touch with uh, Proxon we knew Proxon made the saw for Micromark. And we said, can we uh, sell the uh, Proxon saw? Because Micromark wouldn't wholesale to us because we didn't have a storefront. So anyway, yeah, they said they would. So we did that and we sold the FKS Slant E, which is the saw that uh, is um, the same as the black Micromark saw that a lot of you probably have. Uh, and we did that up until probably about eight or 10 years ago. And then out of the blue, Proxon discontinued this and came up with the FET. So we had to figure out how to use it. And uh, we, we figured it out pretty, pretty quickly and uh, started using it shows and we've been doing it ever since and we've sold quite a few of them. Uh, it's a European design machine. It's uh, uh, made in Taiwan. It's been sold in this country 2011. It comes with a carbide blade, which uh, is under this package of paper somewhere. Looks like this. You can see that pretty well. And that's too, too big for most things in miniatures, particularly for the small scalers. So what we did is we used the, the system that we've been using on the, on the, uh, on the PREAC and came with a smaller blade that looks like this. This is a two and a quarter inch 60 tooth high speed steel slitting saw blade that's made for the metalworking industry, which means that it's available all the time. The saws that we buy are made in Rhode Island and uh, they, the, one of the companies just went out of business, but there's still somebody down in Cranston who's making them. and. Uh, uh, we just got an order, took a while, but we got the order. But anyway, that's, that, that's what we do when there are a variety of saw, saw blades available. Uh, it's, it's hollow ground, it doesn't have any set to teeth. I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, it requires a special adapter to use this blade on this saw. So you, you can, can you see how this adapter goes in there like that, which makes this 5 8 inch hole reduced to a 10 millimeter hole. And uh, that, that's, that's significant because uh, you, can't, you can't just buy one of these saws and put one of these blades on it. You got to either make an adapter or have, it, have us make them an adapter for you. Um, these blades are used for making slots and screws and they're made in the United States. The reason that we use the blades, not only are they small, but they make a very accurate cut. And uh, you never have to sand them on the edges, which is even on the end grain. And that's pretty good because uh, it saves an awful lot of uh, trouble and you have a much more accurate, more accurate cut. And uh, there, there's, we also have available, uh, well, I'm going to talk about blades in a, in a minute, but there's a, it's hard to see this, but you can, you can see that's a, we had a 60 tooth blade. This is a 132 tooth blade. That's very fine. 
that that's really good for doing veneer and things under under probably a 32nd of an inch. Anyway, uh, what is the what is the uh, new about the the FET as opposed to the microlax or the or, or the other the other saws that are out there, the Dremel and so forth? Uh, uh, they they made a more solid fence, and this fence w will lock. Some of them move this way. You don't want them to move that way. This also has the ability to be able to adjust the fence. So every time I get a saw in, I loosen it. I can do it. I loosen it so it moves like this. And then I, I get it. So I want it a little bit, as they'd say in sports, open a little bit, a little bit to the a little bit to the right, to my right at the end. So when I cut it, doesn't bind. These blades are really, really nice, but they will bind. By binding, what I mean is that the saw, the wood actually sticks in the saw and either either slows the uh, slows the blade or uh, down or slops stops the motor or kicks back at you. Neither one is something that you want it to do. So I I I basically just set up this up by eye, and it's probably pretty good. I'll I'll check in when we get get to ripping. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. It tightly locks. It also has the ability to make fine adjustments. You can see I've got a knob here that's moving the fence. Then this black knob tightens it. Now that's that's nice. Now you got to understand that the, the, the grad, gradations in the knob, the grad, graduations in the knob are uh, in metric. So. You might as if you're going to use this, it's good to learn that uh, that a one millimeter is forty thousandths of an inch. That doesn't mean a whole lot to you because forty thousandths of an inch is two thirds of a sixteenth, which is a little confusing. Anyhow, you you use this all the time. You get you get in in the uh, habit of uh, of doing that. Okay. Uh, they and the other thing that they did with this is they put some support under this. This thing here is called a blade insert. And on all the other sides, it's, it's, it has a tendency to be springy. So you have to be careful that you don't push down on it when you're pushing things through because it's strange things happen. So they were able to do that by, by putting, putting a, a different blade insert into it. And they also uh, provide a, a zero clearance insert, which means it has no slot in the insert. The green thing's the insert. So when you bring the um, the blade up through it, it will cut the plastic, and you have no place for things to drop down next to the blade. Um, they also, when they did the the new saw, made a slot that's probably about twice as as deep as the old saws and. They, there's, there's, it, it has a lock on it, so this thing won't pick up. And it's really nice for us because when we, we make our accessories, we have enough depth in the slots so we don't have to get se separate metal. It also comes with a, a very a pretty nice stop. I have to adjust this stop every time I get one because they don't, they, when they made the saw, they didn't consider people were gonna be working on 32nd inch material, but I want this stop flush with the table so I so I machine it that's one of the one of the things we do when we get the saw when we uh, when we get the saw I don't know where I put it I put it somewhere I, I have a, a checklist well it doesn't matter you don't need to see the checklist but it's, 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 it's just it's just a checklist I've got a dozen items on it I have to adjust the fence I have to make sure that uh, the uh, <coughs> The screws in the insert are not sticking up, so things don't don't kick. I check I check it to make sure that the that the blade is actually uh, ninety uh, ninety degrees up and down. I do do a variety of other or other things like that. Uh, I also I also fix this uh, uh, this stop on on this. We'll, we'll look at this in, in a minute. Anyway, that's 
the basic the basic stuff uh, uh, on the saw. Uh, they they drop the variable speed option. The uh, both the Proxon F uh, KS LAN E and the uh, uh, MicroMac had a variable speed op option, which is really nice if you're cutting some things. If you're cutting metal, it's great. <coughs> you can cut aluminum by slowing it down. It's also good for certain types of plastic and other things. I, I got to honestly say I almost, almost never use it. And if I need to use it on this side, I can just put a regular router control on it, speed control, uh, which is available just about anywhere. And uh, that will work on that. Uh, this comes, I told you, I showed you the blade that it comes with. Um, and also the small blade. The standard blade we use is, is uh, 28 thousandths thick, which is a little under a 32nd of an inch. And the reason for that is that's as thin as you can get at this two and a quarter inch blade to make a cut without having enough heat to have the blades distort. You get thinner than that and you, you try and cut an eighth inch piece, it might, uh, it might distort. Uh, if you get thicker than that, it takes more power to run it. You, you, you lose more material. So 28,000, the engineer who designed the PREACT figured out that was best. So we use the 28,000 standard. We also have the 20,000 available <coughs> with the fine teeth. The 32,000 uh, is available for making a, a 32nd inch slot or dado or rabbit and a, uh, a 64,000, so just a little over a 16th of an inch for doing 16th inch dados. Uh, so we basically have, they don't come with it, but we, we su supply uh, four blades if people want them and the um, a manufacturer of, uh, supplies the uh, big uh, three inch blade, which I think is a millimeter and a half, which is about a 16th of an inch. Um, okay. What I want to do now is um, stop for a second. Does anybody have any general questions? And I'm going to go into operations next. If they, if they don't, I'll just keep going. All right, the first thing I'm going to show you is, is ripping. Now, ripping is a, is a technical term that's used in, in woodworking. Wood has a grain. And if you cut along the grain, it's called ripping. If you cut across the grain, it's called cross cutting. It's, it's, it's quite, quite different. When, when you rip, it's normally the long direction, but not always just most of the time. Uh, the, just as a matter of course, that, uh, that wood uh, uh, swells and uh, shrinks about 10 times more across the grain than it does along the grain, which means that the grain is very important unless you happen to be using plywood. Anyway, if I want to rip something, I'm going to set the fence. I walked over here without a ruler. Well, I just happen to have one right there. I'm gonna, let's say I'm gonna, well, that's pretty close. That's seven eighths of an inch, that'll work well. It's a piece of 16th inch, it's, it's cherry, it's, it's crummy looking cherry. It's stuff that uh, Pam doesn't use. And so I will, uh, because it doesn't look good in furniture and I use it for either, either drawer insides for this type of work. We normally, Actually, I, before I go any further, I should go through the safety rules on this business. Uh, one of them is to obviously to unplug the, um, the saw before you uh, change blades. Uh, another one is uh, never raise your blade, which you can raise it and lower it. Never raise it any further than you need to. You can't raise this one awful far. Uh, if the blade binds, and we'll see this happening, I'm sure, there's something the matter you got to stop and figure out what the problem is. Sometimes you can you can re reduce it by putting a wedge in. Sometimes you have to make an adjustment. Uh, 
I always recommend wearing full glasses, so I can't say I've ever had anything come up and hit me in the face. I just, I just think it's good to wear uh, glasses anytime you're around any type of power tools. Uh, if you, you happen to do something different. It also, there's also a lot of dust associated with this. And uh, although there is a dust, dust collection on the saw, I usually don't use it, it just falls in, but there's enough dust. So you don't want to get that in your eyes. Uh, there's a blade guard available that comes with it. And I think it probably works okay. I can't say I've ever used it. Uh, I don't, it, it gets in the way, I can't see. Once in a while, somebody says they, they want to use it for something. I would find it difficult to use it, but it's a standard blade guard, which is available on most, uh, certainly that's the style that they have on most European saws. Uh, use a, a push stick when, when you're working within an inch of the blade. That's my rule, within an inch of the blade. Uh, all kinds of push sticks. This makes a very good push stick. We, uh, we ship one of these with the saw. They work okay too. Some people have been known to use uh, pink erasers. I've been known to use uh, um, files or something, which isn't really a good idea, but they, it holds it. You just don't want to run it into your blade. It doesn't help the blade. Anyhow, but always use a push stick with you when you're within an inch of the blade. And uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is never put your fingers beyond the center of the blade. Because what happens when you do, I'll show you when we're ripping. I'm going to start ripping. I, I set this up at 16th of an inch. Uh, I'm going to turn the saw on. Now, I normally what we do is we don't, people have problems with switch, switches. I just saw something, somebody was complaining about a switch on one of their saws and I don't like to use the, the switches on any type of machine, on the machine, uh, particularly these little machines that can avoid it. So we use a power strip. Just got it taped to the table. One hand. That simple. Now, I'll set it up to. I'll just move it over a little bit. That's fine. If you need to hold it, what I do is I will hold it like this and I keep my hand in one position. Now, if I don't do that, I'll show you what can happen. This is one of these don't try this at home things. If I push here, see what happens? It kicks back because you're, you're pushing against the blade back here and that uh, causes a binding and causes it to push back. I don't know where the piece went, but oh, there, there it is. Anyway, that's ripping. Um, when we sell a saw, most of the time, we add a, a wooden fence like this. It's pretty simple. I have to bore the, the new fence, which, which is pretty good. They approved it, so it doesn't move very, very much. I like it because I can go real, real close to the blade without worrying about damaging the fence. Uh, I just, I, I just also feel it, it's, it's more comfortable to use. I've always, I've always used an auxiliary fence. Uh, I was just looking at the about your uh, the, those cameras setting on there, sitting on the uh, on my ten inch sable saw, and I'm looking at the fence where the blade is rubbed up against it and I'm saying to myself, you know, 
do as I say, not as I do. But I'm pre I'm pretty good with this one. Anyway, that's that's ripping. I can take the rip fence off, <coughs> put it aside, and now I'm going to put this miter arm on. Most people don't like these too much. They like to use sliding tables, and we will use sliding tables now. But if you want to make sure the the miter arm is square, ah, see, I can't do that with this one. I can do it with. Let's uh, see, that's interesting. I I can do it. I can do it on the edge of the table, like this. I can do it visually. Or just take a square and put a put a square against it. That's no uh, problem. Uh, just a second. Hi, I'm back. This is a square. You just make sure that you don't want any. You don't want it open. See, that's open just a hair. So it wasn't I, my. I wasn't good enough. I don't want any deviation at all on this, like I did on the fence. That's pretty good. Now, the, what this will cut across the grain. We'll cut a line of grain too, but works like this. Now this bar adjusts. Now typically what I do, on each side that we have, Pam's got one of these in their shop, I will cut with the same blade through the aluminum so I can support the, their, the wood on either side. But I, I don't do it on new new saws because I don't know what people really want to do. And this this is a new saw. When when we get saws into cell, we we prefer to use them in a workshop first, or something like this. If we use them in, in a workshop or two before it goes to a customer, we're pretty darn sure any problems there are, and there are little problems with them. That's that's one of the advantages of getting them for somebody like us who. Who basically knows where the problems are. Anyway, if you want to set the, uh, of course, oh yeah, I did have a, have a ruler. Let's say we want to cut pieces an inch. We'll set an inch. The biggest problem we've had over the years with teaching classes with miniaturists has been people have problems reading scales or rulers. I, I don't have a I don't have a good solution for that. I, I know that Shannon has a good solution. She does it an entirely different method. I what what we generally do is if we're going to teach a class or do a lot of things, we'll we'll make patterns a particular size and color them, and we'll we'll just set up with those patterns so we we aren't messing around with rulers all the all the time. That, that works pretty. That's a little closer than I want to be for this demo. So I'll go here. Anyway, you can cut, you can do this. Whoops. Yeah, I'm forgetting that I'm using a power strip today. And I've got three pieces exactly the right, same length, the square. That's that's pretty good. Now this is this thing is pretty good. I showed you how this works. You can also you can work it on this side, this side of the blade. The only time I ever use it on this side of the blade is when I'm doing bevels on small parts, and we're not going to get into it. But it is an advantage if any of you have taken one of the one of our box classes, like at Guild School or something, you will realize that we do that because that that's how it holds against the stop. You 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 don't want you don't want a thin edge holding it'll go underneath here. But anyway, it's nice to working on this side. It's also nice to be able to set any, any angle that you want on this. I will. I there is one caution. Never trust the markings, the protractor markings on one of these scales. On this particular saw, the one for the bevel on the saw itself is pretty good, and I always check that out. That's one of the things I check out. On this one, this can this can vary a little bit. So I always use a protractor and double check. That's that's on big scale woodworking as well as small scale woodworking. Okay, the, the, that's the way, one way to cut. 
crosscut. This is a preferred way for a lot of people. I make these. I make they're made out of uh, polycarbonate, sometimes referred to as Lexi, and that's a GE trade name for it. Uh, it doesn't shatter. Same same issue. You can you can set the set any distance you want here and cut. It's particularly nice on big pieces. And it's very safe. And it's something that I use. Yeah, that's good. Your eye is a really, really good measure, way of measuring things. If you've got a good square by looking at the light, we'll tell you a huge amount of information. So anyway, that's the sliding table. Uh, I would guess that 90% of the people who buy a table saw will buy the sliding table. It, uh, uh, and I, I can also adjust this thing. They, they made the slots a little bit wider, which made, annoyed me a great deal until I realized that anything that has two bars in it, it gives me a better opportunity to get this so it doesn't jiggle. I don't want this doing moving. This is pretty good. I go through and I check all this stuff. I make sure that the slats are okay before I saw. Okay, that's a, that's a big sliding table. We also make a sliding table for miters. This is basically the same thing, except it's got two bars, quarter inch bars that are glued on there, which is an, an interesting process because uh, uh, you have to use plastic glue and uh, it has a tendency to dry up in the can. It also has a tendency to move around. So I'm, I'm real careful and I have to recheck these. Every, every one of these fixtures and every saw Pam checks. She's quality control on everything. And uh, that's one of the reasons we've been pretty, pretty successful. If I wanna, if I wanna say, let's say I wanna do a picture frame. Now there's a variety of different types of picture frame moldings. There's a standard stuff that you can get from a shop. Most of it's today is made by Northeast scale model down in Methuen, Massachusetts. And I make some, I make some bigger ones and I also make some, this one's a little, I don't know whether you can see that, but that one's a little interesting because it has uh, a deeper, a deeper rabbit in the back, particularly for petty pointers, so they so they can get the thickness in there. Anyway, you got to go from two sides. You cut it like this. The reason I can't do this with just one fence is that I'd have to run the pieces two upside down. And that's not as accurate. I'll make this a little longer. The most popular size picture frame is probably an inch and inch and a half by inch and three quarters in full in one twelve scale. So, uh, again, just a second. You've all seen gluing jig. Some, a lot of you have them. It's probably our most popular product over the years. I make them in three sizes.
And of course, I lost the other, the other, the fourth piece. It fell somewhere. There it is, still on the. A little bit of glue. I used to make them this way. Put them together like that. Pam makes most of them now. She does them. She does a does a, an L and an L and then puts them together. That's more accurate. Uh, but anyway, that's that's one of the things that this will do. Uh, the thing is also very excellent for um, trimming out windows. I mean, you can go with something. That, well, I I said that was about that. That's about five eighths of an inch. That'll that'll do a, do a good job on on trimming out windows. It works. That works pretty well. You rarely have to do very much uh, messing around. We have we have a, a ways of of dealing with that with a a, a, a miter sander. Sometimes we we're, we're doing a frame around a box or around a split or something. Anyway, that's the that's the sliding table for miters. The, the next fixture that we generally make is a uh, taper leg fixture. And that has a rubber band around it so it doesn't fit down into the slot very well. There it goes. Most people understand that in most furniture, tapers are on two adjacent edges on the inside. You rarely see a taper leg table that has tapers all the way around. With the exception of if you've got a third leg in the middle, you might have it three three ways, on the back and on the two sides. But you'd never see the taper on the front. You set this up so it looks like this. Ah, well, so you can see a little bit of a setup. Got up. Pretty straightforward as setups go. This one's got is measured, so you'll you'll know which sides to cut. Whoops! Sounds like front high enough. There it is. That's a very fine taper, but that's okay. You got the idea. I probably wouldn't design it that way. Can you see that? That's basically all that this does, but it will do it for uh, just about any size because I can adjust it this way. These, uh, that particular fixture will work on the uh, Microlux. There's enough. The two sliding tables won't. Uh, okay, let me look at my notes here and see where I am. I was. Oh yeah, I wanted to show you bevels. Okay, the reason for a tilting arbor saw is to cut bevels. Now. Uh, in order to cut a bevel, I have to remove this, and I'm gonna unplug it to do this. I have to remove this insert.
you want to make sure you keep keep these screws because they're not that readily available at metric. I mean, it's not impossible, and I, I keep a stash of them. But uh, and you you wouldn't you wouldn't be out of business if you couldn't couldn't uh, if you only had two of them for a while. But uh, they were hard to find. I finally found a hundred of them in Granger of all places, which uh, surprised me. Ah. That comes out, I'll put the standard insert in it, which is this. Mm. I was so busily talking about the screws that I've lost one of them. I don't think it could have gone awful far, but I'm not going to waste everybody's time by hunting for a screw. And I didn't hear it go clinking into the saw, so I don't know where it is. It's in the it's in the insert. It's the first place I looked. See, it's it's stuck in here. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to uh, a camera. I'm more used to talking to people individually. And so this is a, this is a little little odd. Anyway, I'm going to turn this around so you can see it. Sort of see it. Bring the camera down a little. This is marked. I'll bring this over to 45 degrees like that. Pretty straightforward. Bring the saw back around. I'll take, um, oh, I had to cut some pieces out just to do this. These will work. I'm going to use my uh, rip fence. This is always a little tricky to put this on. You got to fiddle with it. If I can't get it, I'll just call Pam and she'll come in and put it on in, a, in about a second. There it is. The, the black knob wasn't pushed in quite a ways. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring this over about here. And uh, a push deck, like the saw back in. Go, go, go quite far enough. That's good. Okay, I've got four pieces here. Uh, 
see how one push stick works better one for one thing than another. Okay, so I got four pieces. And what I'm gonna do is just a little, little demo. I'm gonna get a uh, little, uh, I got a little bit of blue tape here. What I'm gonna do, I'll move this out of the way. Take the blade down for a second. Put this tape on the table, like so. You want to use the junkiest tape you can find. The thinner, the better. I learned how to do this for a, a, a man who was making a um, variety of um, decorative little boxes for the, uh, at, a, at a, an event at the uh, Guild of New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire Woodworkers. I should have said the New Hampshire Woodworkers Guild. You get that together, you, you wanna make sure that these things are absolutely touching. You might even, even stretching it a little bit is pretty good and lined up. You can do this with four sides, with six sides, with eight sides, however many you want. Well, that didn't true to form. But you can see that'll make a, a perfect box. And that's one of the things you can do with bevels. You can do a lot of other things with them, but I, th I thought that was sort of a fun thing. Okay, my next, the, the next act on this uh, is I wanna talk a little bit about uh, uh, blade changes and finger joints. And what I'm going to do, is I'm going to have Pam come in and do this because she's uh, um, she does it all the time. She's good at it, and I want to. I, I she's she's very involved. So I'm Pam, ready for you. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be. I'm going to be right here and talking. She probably won't talk much, but uh, I just just finished the bevels, and I've got the 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 big insert in there. What, and we're ready to uh... ready to go with the blade. Ready change? to go with the blade change. But the first thing we want to do is un un unplug the saw. If you don't know that, you all know Pam. I hope most of you do. Hi. <laughs> okay, saw is unplugged, and the first thing I'm going to do. There are two uh, little Allen wrenches that uh, come with the saw, take the smaller of the two and drop it down this hole in here and rotate the blade by hand till it drops further down and the blade will only wiggle so far. That keeps it stable while you uh, uh, work on the rest of this. Now I'm going to unscrew a little yellow knob with a washer that's on the front here looks like this and I'm going to stash it in this little magnetic parts thing which I find very handy when I'm uh, trying to corral little parts 
on the desktop. I'm going to raise the uh, raise the hood here and take the larger of the two Allen wrenches and put it in the end of the knob here. Now, uh, Pete, can you uh, move one or the other of the uh, uh, monitors so they can see what's in here? No. No, you can't. Okay. Well, I, I can move this. Okay. I'll try it. We'll see how it works. I just can't see what, what okay. they can see. All right. Uh, drop a little bit. Okay, I think that may be it. So you, you can see there. And uh, I'm going to loosen the uh, no, It's okay now. I'm just basically feeling for it. I'm going to unscrew it the rest of the way. You want to twist it around sideways? Uh, no, that's okay. Okay. That's okay. Uh, I, I've got a, a, a little uh, a screw and a, a collar. I'm going to put those in the uh, parts tray. And now I'm going to pick out the blade. Actually, I find it easier to raise the blade a little bit more so I can grab onto it. I'm just coming out of there with the uh, uh, bushing that holds it in place. Now notice she has a standard insert. She doesn't have the, the zero clearance. If she had the zero clearance insert, then she'd have to remove the insert. Okay, so I'm going to put the uh, old blade there. This is the 064. I'm going to put the, um, the bushing. in there. It should kind of snap in and you, you should see it very evenly along in there, just like that. Now, I'm going to drop it in there and fish for that hole. I think I may have to drop it down a little bit. part is a little fiddly. I'm used to doing it with no insert in there at all, so it's a little... Okay. Nope, we're not quite on there yet. No, I've got to get that insert out of there, Pete. Okay, take it out. I'll get it out for you. When I, you... I have a question. It's gotten uh, a little off kilter there, and that's not going to work. So I need a little bit more access as Pete takes out these screws. I'm putting them in my little magnetic parts tray. Any auto parts store will have these. They're great. Where'd it go? Don't worry about it. We'll Maybe do down it. inside. Oh, don't worry about it. Let's just get that out of there. Okay. All right. Do It'll turn right up. Okay. Okay. Blade is here. The bushing is retrieved. We're going to see if we can do this. A little more smoothly. Oh, the other thing to remember is when you're putting it in, 
always do it so that the uh, uh, the teeth are facing pointing toward you. It will cut if it's in backwards, but badly. It, it'll be burning. You will wonder what in the world is wrong with the saw. Check for that. I put another screw in there for you. Okay. Okay. Now I, I felt that click in very nicely. And so I'm going to take the screw and the collar. for the hole. And okay, there she goes. It always goes much more smoothly when nobody's watching. And I'm going to take the Allen wrench and tighten it up again. It's been hand tight that this is the right one. One of the mistakes that an awful lot of users have is to tighten this, the blade up too tight. It doesn't need to be that tight. It needs to be just, just to a bearing a little bit, but don't tighten it real, real tight because then it's hard to get off. This little thing in the process of pulling it around has come loose so that the, the uh, uh, blade is spinning freely. I just want to make sure that I've got it in there so that it is there. Okay. Uh, if you're using more than two fingers, you're working too hard. Now, before I do anything else, I'm going to rotate this. No. Nope. nope. It's it's not on properly. I'm going to take the phone off, and I want to show them that. You can see it's it's um, oscillating a bit. It's higher at one point and lower at another. Okay. On there properly. There, there we go. You, you always want to check this when you do that to make sure that the... There's a little arm in there that uh, props it up. Now I'm going to loosen this. Oh yeah. When I do that, when I, I, I listen for it to click and then I can make another quarter turn. I can tell because I'm making another quarter turn with a cap screw that holds it on. That tells me. So that looks good. I think so. Okay. If there's any disadvantage of this FET saw over uh, over the old uh, FKS Lanny or the micro mark is it is more difficult to change the blade. You got to this, this business of opening it up. Okay. Now. Okay, we are happy with this now. Okay, you want me to go ahead? It's all yours. Okay, I'm gonna, first thing I'm gonna do is, uh, could I have the, uh, I need, I'm gonna need that, that, inf that stuff you've got there, Pam. I need the screws and I need the uh, little yellow. I'm gonna put this, I'm gonna lock, lock the saw first with the yellow thing. And the third one is here. 
Okay. I put the zero clearance insert back in. I'm not sure why they put three screws here. I think two would have been that enough. It's been German engineers. They do strange things sometimes. That just makes it makes it that it takes it a little bit longer. And what I'm going to do when this is, and I'm going to set, I'm going to set this so it goes. Uh, this is the right size. It should be. Well, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it. It may not be the right size. I'll find the other one later. That'll be fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple pieces of. 16th inch material. Right I'm all set. Okay. Why? You know, working as partners with your spouse for uh, 30 years or something like this is an interesting experience. Now what I'm doing is I'm writing, I'm sliding this back and forth until I can just feel it, the touch of it. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this final fixture, which is for cutting finger joints or box joints. I put that on. Better. And I'm going to take a couple pieces like this. Make sure this thing is square. Plug the saw in. Turn the saw on. Going right up to the pit. Now, can you see? Now the pin. Go right up to the pin here. Make one cut, then bring that over the pin. Some people call these dovetails are not dovetails, they're finger joints. And I, they need to be offset by one, one uh, increment, which happens to be a sixteenth of an inch. And that's what the finger joint fixture looks like. Okay, now that's basically the last operation that I'm going to show. A couple of things that I do wanted to mention in troubleshooting this. Uh, if uh, most people have a tendency to go too fast, you want to you want to go through the saw slowly. You, you don't want to don't want to jam it through the slow if through the saw. If you happen to be going through when you're ripping and it binds, turn it off and make a couple of wedges to look like this. And just put it in the in the slot behind the saw. I can I can I can do it with this. It's it's really not the right blade, but I can do it anyway. 
if I can see how long it takes me to get this guy on today, this time. Not as long. I'm going to bring this up. This is a wide, a thick blade, so it it'll sound a little bit different. It's not binding, but if it were, and it were, it does. A uh, 20, 28 thousandths blade, you would, um, it, that, that would just go in there like that. And if it's tapered, you can, by using a wedge, that will, that will keep it up. That's one, that's one thing where people have a lot of problems. I, I think now is a good time to stop and ask if anybody has any questions. Someone did have a question, Pete. Um, are, we, are we muted? No. Oh, hi there. I'm Denise and um, uh, with Gail. And um, my question is the two miter slots, what's the distance from the outside edge to the outside edge? Well, I don't happen to have that right on the top of my head. I'll have to get a, a, a caliper. Hold on a second. But the reason I'm asking is, the, other day. The, the reason I'm asking oh. is um, we have a different saw, and I want yeah. to make sure that the distance is uh, four and a half inches, um, because then your jigs that you made would work if we wanted to order them. Which saw? Uh, which saw do you have? Um, it's the Burns. It won't work. What? No, that won't work on a burn saw. Hmm. It's a different, the burn, he, I, I think he uses a, a half inch sli uh, size, but that's too, that, that's about four and an eighth. But uh, it, um, these slots are 340,000s. Ah, okay, yeah, his, his slots are exactly, Half inch. Yeah, I know. It's like he, he just copied the preac and made it bigger. We I, we always call it a preac on steroids. All right, thank I you. I cut most of the floor. I cut most of the flooring in the first version of uh, K Browning's museum in Maysville with one of those saws that I was reviewing for for uh, uh, the old uh, the old uh, uh, nutshell new scale manager magazine and. Uh, so I cut a lot of stuff with it. It's a very good saw. It works very much like the pre -ec. It's very different than this. It doesn't tilt either. No, you have to buy a tilting table. Yeah. So I don't think there's, there's anything. I think you could use a, I think you could use a, a leg taper jig. That would probably work on it. Oh, right. Other than that, you just have to make your own. I, I, you know, I still, every once in a while, every couple of years, I, I'll, I'll end up making some fixtures for pre -ex. There are a lot of them kicking around, but there's, they're a lot smaller than the burns. Okay. Well, thank you. No, it's a good machine, but I just don't, uh, I don't, it doesn't, doesn't work. Anything else? I have a question. I have a Proxon FET that I bought from Proxon because I didn't know you were a reseller. I would have. Can I buy all of the attachments you showed us directly from you? Are they on your website? Yes, you can buy them. Where are you located? Racine, Wisconsin, between Milwaukee yeah. and Chicago. Yeah. Uh, you can buy them from us. The problem with them is it's usually better to set them up to the saw. Now, depending on how clever you are, Not mechanically, you, they, they will all work. But you, they might have to. Be, you might have to make some adjustments on the sliding tables, the finger joints, and so forth. But uh, uh, we have done it, and people have done it, and people have sent us the saw, and we've done it for them. Either way. Do you ever have workshops at Tom Bishop's show whenever he can do it again? Yeah, we always have a workshop at Tom Bishop's show on Wednesday. I will sign up for that, but buy the parts in the meantime. 
Thank you. Thursday. Pete, I, Pete, I have a question Thursday. for you. Pete, this is, yes. Susan, this is Susan Farnick here. With, with, with the miter uh, attachment that you put on the, on the saw, is there some, is it, can you extend it to make longer lengths by just putting a, a, another little piece of wood on the on one of the miters um, so yes, you can have a longer can, length? You can, not only can you extend it, but you can also put it closer to the blade if you're doing shorter things. And we, we, okay. we do that, we use our best friend double, uh, double face carpet tape. As okay. a matter of fact, I even brought some in because I knew that this question was likely to come up. And, you know, for those of, for those of you who have the dig indignity of going to Walmart, this is, uh, this is what it is. This works very well. This happens to be the uh, duck brand, double face copper tape. Just cut a strip off. You can just glue it right onto that and it'll work fine. You glue the, the, the tape onto the existing piece of plastic and then glue a- I do it the other way around. I put it on the wood and then put it on. As oh, a matter okay. of Pam just came in with something. Fine. Okay. So then your your um, clamp can go further out and you can cut a longer piece. Sure can. Okay. That's what I needed to know. And you Thank can you. also make it you can also make it wider to make it rigid if you need to, too. Thicker. To make Thicker. it what? You know, you, go ahead, get in there, Pam, some show. Her. This is kind of springy. Yes, I see that. If you uh, work with a thicker piece of wood, it will be stiffer. Right. Okay, excellent. Can Next. I ask a question about the fence, the rip fence? Yeah. Okay, so I just got my saw. I haven't plugged it up. I haven't started it yet or anything, but um, I am having trouble getting the rip fence on and off. And I'm, it was kind of nice to see that you were also having trouble getting the rip fence on and off. Um, I wondered if you had any hints about that, number one. Ma'am, <laughs> okay. are, are you the lady who just bought a saw? I, well, I am. Yeah, I thought you might be. Pam will tell you this because Pam seems to have this figured out better than I do. I had one, one very experienced uh, uh, builder of uh, room boxes who said his saw was no good and wanted to send it back. I, I worked with him for a long time to do it. He, it, it it's tricky. I won't mention his name because that wouldn't be fair. <laughs> Some of you might figure it out. <laughs> Come on, you uh, oh. I don't yeah, know what the question is. Getting the fence on. Oh, okay. I'm gonna turn this around a little bit. comes off easily every time. No, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, it loosen, loosen the yellow, use, loosen the yeah. yellow knob. Right. And it will slide off easily. Both of, both of these things need to be loosened to get it off. So you see, you've got uh, kind of a, uh, uh, a, an angled surface there. That is going to fit over this part, it, it slides. I'm, I'm at a bad angle here. If you can hold it, Pete, that'd be good. You notice she's having no problem. Okay, <laughs> I've gotten it uh, going on to here now. If, um, if it's um, giving you trouble, try wiggling this knob and it will slide and get loose uh, that way. Wiggling it in and out. In and out, uh, it's it's still it's still loose here. Oh. Now get it pretty much where you want, and tighten the um, uh, the yellow knob first. Leave this one loose. Now this will let you use the fine adjustment knob over here to move it in and out just a very little bit. If you can see it moving uh, against the um, uh, the green insert, 
you can tell you it's a very fine adjustment. Now what's going to happen when, it, when you get that set where you want, then tighten the black knob. It may jump a little bit. It does. It usually bit. does. If it has uh, moved too much and is not acceptable, loosen the black knob. Make your adjustment out here on this because this yellow knob clamps the whole fence to this bar. So it will move very slightly along the bar. Now I'm going to tighten it up again. I'm seeing it jump once more, but I've okay, made that's the adjustment. Good. That's it. Thank you, Pam. I'm going to put this thing back up. Any more questions? Yes, yes. Um, did you change the blade to a bigger blade before you did the finger joints? Is that why you changed the blade? Yes, we went from a okay. 28,000 thick to a 64,000 thick blade. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, you can, do, you can make a finger joint out of 28,000, but you'd have to have a fixture that had a 28,000 uh, uh, pin in it and, a, and everything would have to be done. We've done it with 30, 32,000 and we did it in a class and it's quite, uh, it's a little exciting to do it. It can be done. We find in classes that we, what we generally do is uh, do pairs and have one person watch the other one doing the cutting because sometimes you have to make sure this fixture is down. So we, if, if you're having problem, it doesn't help to have another person with you to watch it. Thank you. I mean, it doesn't hurt, yes. It doesn't hurt, yeah. Victoria also had a question. Hi, Pete. Um, I purchased a Proxon from you a number of years ago, which you fitted for me. Um, will any of these additional um, things like the sliding table and the sliding um, miter work for that Proxon? The, it's, it's the FKS Land E? No, it's a, D, it's a DS-115E. I don't know what that is. Well, that's the model I had. Yeah, did you get that from us? Um, yeah, year, probably over a decade ago when you first started selling the Proxons. Yeah, it's the FKS Land E. Uh, it, I'm gonna take the camera off for a second. And it's, uh, whoops, I got this thing plugged in. Is it this one? Um, you know, it, uh, yeah, it looks like that one. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, it. The, that's the it. slots aren't deep enough. Oh, okay. You know, the slots, the slots aren't, aren't deep enough. So I, I have to make special, special fixtures for that saw. Is that possible? It's possible. What I like to do is I like to get a number of them. Okay. I mean, if you want to, if you want to email me and uh, and get the uh, uh, what you want, I'll I'll you know I'll take a look at it. It's okay. You know, I can always ask my daughter who just got a great job to buy me a new saw. That could work just as well too. <laughs> well, I don't think you really need a new saw. Oh, I, but, I use this all the time. I love it. I love it. Have I lost, have I lost the picture? Yeah. yeah, you did. All right, hold on. Keep asking questions. I'll try and answer them. I got um, it back now. Okay, I have a question from Susan that wanted to know if you wax your saw. Yes, I do. Any type of paste wax, like butcher's wax or, or Renaissance wax or anything like that is, is good, to, good to use. Uh, particularly in the slots. And uh, anytime, anytime on the table, anytime that you're sliding anything over anything, it's good to wax it on any of your equipment. Is that, is that okay? Is that all you need? Yeah. Um, uh, is, uh, she asked if car wax, um, turtle wax, that kind of stuff, would that work? Use paste wax. I don't know. Okay. 
Okay. I, you know, it might, but I, I really don't know. I, I haven't tried it. Okay. I also have a question from Bonnie that says, how thick of wood can it cut? Well, theoretically, with the big, big blade, it'll cut an inch. I, ha I have never cut a piece an inch thick with it. Uh, I think it'd, it'd be, be, you'd have to be pretty careful. I, I, if, the, if everything was just right and sharp, it would probably cut an inch. I know it'll cut three quarters. How thick are the uh, things that you cut with the butcher block? About, about three eighths? Um, probably. So we, we regularly cut oak three eighths thick. It also depends on how, how thick the wood is, but I, uh, uh, it will, it, you know, you have room enough to cut a, to cut an inch, at least. But again, that's not, not recommended. Although in Europe, they use this thing for everything. Okay, what else? Anything else? Well, thank you very much, Pete. Um, we okay. really appreciate it. Okay, before, before I go, before I go, a couple of things. One of them is that uh, Roy asked me to give people an idea what the general, general overall cost of this is. And it's around, with everything, it's around $600. With the, with the, the basic saw, with, with just the, and the minor stuff is about three twenty or about 425. The second thing I wanted to ask whether anybody wanted to stick, stick around and spend, spend 10 minutes and have a shop tour. I do. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Like it's going to be a little yeah, rocky. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing lots of yeses in the, um, oh, yeah, there's a ton of yeses in the chat room, Pete. So I think they're okay, very I will. interested. My, my issue with it is, everybody, that I, I, can't, I can't turn my, my phone around. So I'm going to just have to point it at it and hope it works. Able to, if I could get on. Why don't you try and get on? Pam's going to try and get on with her. Uh, her uh, iPad and see if she if there's room. And what I'll do is I'll I'll drop off this one. Uh, I'll leave from the the one I was trying to use that wasn't working. That should give a space. And then she can do it. I uh, did have, original, Yeah, go ahead. Um, I did have another question that Susan asked. Um, what does it mean when your saw gets a high pitch sound? A high pitch sound when you're cutting or when you're not cutting? Um, my guess is when you're cutting. That's, that's just another form of binding. It means, it means that the, 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 back, the back of the curve on the back of the blade is probably rubbing in some fashion. If it, if it happens when you're not cutting, it could be a lot of things. And while you're waiting for, for the uh, tour, I, I also had another question. Yeah, go ahead. Cam, Cam wants to know sure. how much the saw weighs. How heavy is it? What is it when you what ship it? What is it when you ship it? It's 26 pounds. Okay, you got to turn. Okay, you got to turn. How do you want? be better now. All right, this is this is the right, setup that we were using today. And uh, these are these are some other saws that we have. That's a um, it's a microlex on the right and it's a FET on the left. That's a that's a a, 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 a big microlex sander. That's a preac. That's with a big table. That's a preac with a small table. And I, that's this is this is my little shop where I do a lot of metal work. And you see, there's a few pliers, a spray booth, a drill press, a little a micromark drill press, which is pretty good. And uh, 
Then I've got, it's a full word working full shop, the thickness sander for doing the lumber, the, um, the planer, one duplicate lathe, that's the tag. And that's the uh, CarboTech duplicate lathe. This area over here is uh, metalworking with a uh, shear, shear line lathe, a shear line uh, mill on the, uh, on the left and a tag mill on the right. And of course, a big drill press, a tapping machine and a variety of other odds and ends of things. That's my regular woodworking tools and so forth here. Now that's my shop pretty much. I don't know why I'm still getting feedback. She, that stuff should be far enough away. We are. This is Pam's shop in here. As you can see that she's got the FET that we were just looking at. She's got a, uh, an old Unimat 3, a CarboTech duplicator lathe, a pre saw, She's got our, a scroll saw, camera and drill press, and, a, and a, an MF70 uh, Proxine mill, and a, a Proxine shaper they don't make anymore, as well as a sander. Now that's a lot of stuff. I think uh, you you can you can you can see. Um, you can also get an indication of how much stuff we have process stored. Those are all parts, finished pro projects and so forth in here. I've got the basic same thing in here. That stuff, all those blue blocks is the things that I got from Charlie, Charlie Mitchell in the Tinker's box. It, I got them from somebody else who had them, went through down the line, but it was his stuff. And I've been sort of using some of his parts and uh, show the view out the uh, window. What? Show the view out the window. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Pam yeah. says show the view out the window. <laughs> that's that's what that's Seven's Pond out there, the twenty-five that's acre fine. pond. And uh, there's nobody on it right now. Just just snow. And. Uh, I think that anybody got any question about any of that stuff? It's a little overwhelming. And I got all this feedback. I'm getting several I want that shop messages on the Just chat. Make an offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay. okay. Well, I'm done. That's it. Well, that was terrific, Pete. And I'm very glad you took us on a tour around your um, shop. Uh, I have a bunch of thank yous coming in, but Susan Farnick wants to know if you can still get a duplicator for the lathe. Yes, for, for a tag, certainly. Okay. Again, it's the, it's the old story. She, she can get it, but she's going to have to have, probably have to have me make her another base because it's the, the base on her lathe is probably too small. But she can contact me. Okay. One thing I wanted to do, which I didn't do, is uh, I, I, this got, got messed up because I couldn't get the thing together running the way I wanted it to, but this is, this is our information. <laughs> 